So welcome all to this uh, third sponsor talk about uh, of the web conference 2022. We are glad to welcome uh, Merwan Deba from TII to give you a very promising talk entitled Energy Bill of Extreme Scale Language Models from Theory to Practice. But first, let me introduce the speaker and his institution, uh, which we are proud to have as sponsor for the conference. Uh, the Technology Innovation Institute, also known, known as uh, TII, is a research pillar of the Advanced uh, Technology Research Council, which is Abu Dhabi's government organization for promoting uh, research and development in the Emirates. Uh, TII is a pioneer gl global research and development center that has seven dedicated uh, research centers in quantum computing, uh, autonomous robotics, cryptography, advanced materials, digital security, directed energy, and secure systems. TII works well with universities, research institutions, and uh, in the industry partners from all over the world. It contributes, it contributes to build uh, an R&D uh, ecosystem in Abu Dhabi and in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, and it uh, reinforces Abu Dhabi and the United Emirates uh, uh, status as a global hub for innovation and contributes uh, to the broader development of the knowledge-based economy. About our speaker, uh, Merwan Deba, uh, he is a chief research officer at TII uh, in Abu Dhabi since 2021. He's also an adjunct professor uh, at the Mohammed bin Zayed University for Artificial Intelligence in Abu Dhabi. Uh, previously, he was uh, a lot of things. He was uh, first uh, working at Motorola Labs in France from uh, 1999 to 2002. He was assistant professor in UACOM in France until 2007. He was a full professor at Central Supélec in 2007 as well. Uh, he was director at Alcatel Lucent until 2014. And uh, he was vice president of the Huawei French Research Center. Uh, until 2021. His research interests uh, lie in fundamental mathematics, algorithms, statistics, and information and communication sciences. Merwan received a lot of uh, distinctions. He's uh, a Knight Tripoli Fellow, uh, WWR Fellow, uh, Eurozip Fellow, and uh, uh, AIA Fellow. Uh, as well as uh, Institut Louis Bachelier Fellow and Membre Merit from SE. He was a recipient of the ERC grant MORE in, uh, from 2012 to uh, 2017. He was also a recipient of the Mario Boyla Award in 2020, uh, 2005, uh, the EEEE uh, Glavio Prize Award in 2011, the Qualcomm Innovation Prize uh, Award in 2012, the IEEE Radio Communication Community Technical Recognition Award in 2019, and the SE Blondel Medal in uh, 2020. Uh, in his talk, Merwan will uh, present an estimate of the energy bill of an extreme scale language model, which is called NUR. In this project, uh, he intends to develop one of the largest multitask Arabic language models in the Arab world. Uh, which is able to, pay, to perform a wide range of downstream tasks uh, via natural language prompts. He will transparently assess the full energy bill of the whole project, including storage, research uh, and development, training, serving, and other ex exogenous uh, costs uh, of, the, of the, the project. I'm not going to spoil the rest of the, the talk, and I uh, will now leave the, the floor to uh, to Mirwan Deba. Uh, just before uh, before this, uh, I, I just want to, to to remind you to not hesitate to use the Q and A tool in Zoom for uh, your question, and we will come back to them uh, at the end of the talk. Mirwan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the long introduction. So first of all, I'm extremely happy to be here and I hope that next time uh, we'll be able all together to, uh, um, together. Uh, so my talk is about what we call here the energy bill of extreme scale language models. And um, one of the purpose is that we started uh, more than eight months ago working on basically building the biggest language model in Arabic called NOR, which was announced like two weeks ago. 
And basically here, it's more about the practice that we got from there, from there, and especially on the energy consumption. I'll explain also why I'm heavily interested in what I call the here, the energy efficiency of AI in general, but here it's on the large scale language model. The work was done with, with, with my with collaborators from TII, Imad Lakim, uh, Ibtissam al Mazray, Ibrahim uh, uh, Abul al Hol, and also Julien Lonet, who is also a member of a startup called Lighton in Paris, that I'd like to thank, and with whom we've been working closely for building this exascale model. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I will not spend time, but of course, I've been working many years in the intersection, I would say, of uh, uh, mathematics, signal processing, communication, and machine learning. And now I'm chief researcher here at uh, TII, which is called the Technology Innovation Institute, which is, Abu Dhabi, which is in Abu Dhabi, and working basically on the fields of telecommunication, cybersecurity, and AI, which is the purpose. Uh, my talk will be divided in four parts. One is going to be a very general introduction to explain why we got interested into this problem. Then talking about the new trend today in machine learning related to what we call foundational models, which are these models of uh, GPT-3-like uh, of roughly uh, more than 10 billion parameters. And explaining also the new kind of architectures that are being built on that related to not using NLP, classical NLP approaches, but what we call transformers to be able, of course, to start learning uh, these uh, function approximation that we're talking about. And then I'll, I'll go directly on NOR and explain what it does and uh, then uh, assess the carbon footprint, which will be the longest part, by the way, because I think this is where we got a lot of insight, understanding basically uh, the impact of AI on the E. So of course, I think you're all familiar with machine learning, AI, uh, deep neural networks, which are well have spines, I will not have time to spend on. But, but roughly, I think it's very important to look at the history, where, as you all know, a lot of things started in 1956 with this gathering of outstanding researchers talking about uh, or defining what is artificial intelligence. And what's very striking is all the two winters on which we went in. And especially in the 1980s, I know many of you, or at least some of you were part of, were part of that, related to what we call the expert system or system expert in French, and where basically a lot of people jumped into that hype and for which then we got a winter, and now there is an explosion. And the big question today is, is there gonna be a new winter? And of course, this is what, this is what triggered my work uh, with respect to these large angle models, because I uh, deeply feel that uh, the energy consumption that we're turning, by the way, this is all the technology that we're talking about, blockchains and all these things, as you know, they have a huge carbon footprint. And because we're taking computation for granted. And I think, of course, this is something that we need to tackle uh, to avoid basically a next generation winter in terms of the overall bills that is incurring to be able to train our models, but also to get the results in terms of inference. And that, of course, comes with a nice paper or a nice blog that I strongly encourage you, encourage you to read of Rich Sutton about called The Bitter Lesson, which, of course, pushed all the people. Uh, to understand better that computation had a huge role in all the gains that we had today. And he says it bluntly in his text that the biggest lesson that can be read from 70 years of AI research is that general methods that leverage computation are ultimately the most effective and by a large margin, which turns out to be effectively true. And that's what we realized also. But then the question is, how much does it cost you to get those general methods which leverage computation? And is it compatible with the kind of, of course, society that we want to build in terms of all the models then that we're building due to the crashing of the computation that we're doing. So for that, I'll do a couple of steps in terms of introducing this uh, new hype around these, what we call foundational models and how good they are in building basically these language models uh, in, in various disciplines. And I think you saw with the announcements of DeepMinds and all and Google every time on the number of parameters that they're incurring. But I want to have at least an introduction because I'm not sure everybody's familiar uh, with these kind of approaches. Now, of course, the paradigm shift in machine learning is, is to do what we call extreme scale learning and extreme scale training, to be honest. And this goes, of course, to the fact that you have a huge number of data set on which you're going to play, but also high quality data. And this is also very important on which you're going to do all this creation and curation and for which you're going to build this foundational model which has, at the end, 
various end task applications. And uh, the number of applications today that we're seeing is tremendous. It goes from computer vision to, of course, uh, classical, of course, language processing, but also proteins like AlphaFold and other things that are happening at the moment uh, when, within various, I would say, centers. And of course, uh, the idea is that the bigger you are, the better you boost your performance. And over the last four years, the, state, the size of state-of-the-art basically language model has doubled nearly every three or four months, with also huge investments from companies in building what we call supercomputers, which are able to achieve those things. The same thing also is the data, which we're talking about, is tremendously huge. We have extreme scale language models, which are extremely greedy in data. And here I'm talking about uh, the recent announcements that have been done, either with Lambda, GPT-3, Jurassic, Growth, or, or also basically MTA and LG for which we achieved recently more than 530 billion parameters to, of our model, and with the number of tokens, which is roughly around 300 billion of tokens. And here, the performance depends strongly on scale and weakly on the model shape. Of course, this pushes you to compute more to get better results and compute, of course, larger models. And the larger it gets, the better it is. Now, of course, in these uh, extreme uh, scale language model, there are some things that you need to understand when you jump into that field, is that, of course, uh, the language modeling performance improves smoothly as we increase the model size, the data size, and the amount of compute used for training. So this is some recent, I uh, would say, paper that uh, was published by DeepMind, where basically it's not just about the model size, which kicks in, but also basically the, the data that size that you have, and also the time in which you train that model. And the amount of time that you train that model on which also consumes, of course, uh, 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 let's say energy, it has also a big impact. And of course, for optimal performance, all three factors will be scaled up in tandem. And empirical performance has a power law relationship with each individual factor when not bottlenecked by the other two. So you need to find the right tuning between playing the, between these different factors. And of course, this is related also with the computing kind of, of ability that you have. And the fact that, of course, training time has an importance comes also with this new paper of DeepMind, which revisited the kind of, uh, I would say, benchmark that we had with Kaplan and all. And I strongly encourage you, it's called Training Compute Optimal Large Language Model. And basically, current language models are un significantly undertrained. We don't spend too much time training them. We're just looking at the number of parameters. And basically, uh, the amount of training data and time that you do it, that you go over is extremely important. And so under a compute budget constraint that you have, one should determine the corresponding number of parameters and tokens to achieve the best possible loss that, you, that you're going to be building. And for example, the recent, I would say, model called Chinchilla, well, basically it uses the same compute budget as Gopher, but has only 17 billion parameters and four times more data. And what's interesting about that is that the size being smaller, we're talking about 70 billion here with respect to the others, which are roughly around 175 for GPT-3 or the Megatron Turing and LG 530. Well, it performs even better for a high range of number tasks, which means also that the kind of benchmark to assess the, 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 the gratefulness, I would say, of a model will not be necessarily in the future only related to the number of parameters that model has, but also basically this uh, 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 combination of, I would say, parameters I was talking, which is the compute time, which takes also into factor those things. Let's go now on looking, of course, because we're talking about net and natural language processing and of course, language model, how NLP has evolved also in that discipline with respect to this big trend related to language models. Now, of course, uh, most of the natural language processing systems are based on simple statistical rules or non-complex machine learning algorithms, okay? And the capabilities of this system, as we all know, are very limited only to very few tasks, what we call bas basically this narrow AI on which uh, all these NLP approaches are doing. And now when you do modeling, and of course, when you do modeling languages, what do we really mean by that? Well, in general, what you want is basically to be able to predict the next word. And here, what you want to do is predict basically the property distribution that we're talking about. So what happens is that, of course, you have a conditional distribution P. 
and you have a context. For example, I'm in the UAE here, and what you want to know is what is the capital, and fi finish the sentence here and do what we call a, a, an extension of your text, where the capital of the United Arab Emirates is Abu, and then you need to find X. And so what you want to find is what is the property of having X, knowing that context. And what you're going to do is some functional approximation of that property distribution. And the question is, what is the kind of architecture which will enable you to do that uh, uh, function or property distribution approximation and which kind of data set? So in this case, of course, we're talking about an autoregressive causal modeling that you're doing. And of course, you could also look at the problem of the capital of the X uh, Arab Emirates is Abu Dhabi. And here, Basically, you're doing some kind of acosal or denoising modeling to do that. Now, when you look at how you do this function approximation, well, the question is, of course, you look at the techniques related to machine learning and how it was done before 2017. And there you have various approaches. One is sequence to sequence modeling, okay? And in that case, you have quite interesting approaches where you have emergence of new tasks with these new architectures like translation, summarization, text completion. The other is to use, of course, RNN, uh, LSTM approaches. The problem is that they cannot learn long dependencies in general, and they fail whenever you have long sentences, okay? And when you do some kind of parallelization because uh, you wanna go faster instead of looking at sequential, well, it doesn't paralyze uh, uh, at all. And so, uh, up to 2017, and this uh, paper that I'd also strongly encourage you to read, Attention is All You Need, of course, attention mechanism have been uh, uh, proposed to solve some of the caveats I was talking about, okay? And one of the very interesting things about attention mechanism through also what we call the transformer uh, architecture is that they can learn these long dependencies and they can be parallelized. And this is, of course, great for us in the approach we want, we want to do. And in terms of, 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 uh, of basically uh, the transformers, you have, of course, different ways of doing it, okay? And these, I would say, attention mechanisms have revolutionized the way we do NLP today. Uh, State-of-the-art NLP models today are composed of a set of uh, stacked multi-head attentions, uh, which uh, here I'm, put, I'm, I'm, I'm providing you the three kind of different architecture where either it's an encoder, decoder, and this is typically the T5 type architecture. A, a notoregressive LM here, basically where uh, uh, you have a decoder only and it's uh, mostly related to GPT uh, approaches. And then you have what we call the prefix LM, which is mostly an encoder. One good part about that is of course, uh, uh, also is that you're not into uh, uh, supervised techniques where you need to label the data. They're all based on what we call self-supervised models and basically they're also be able, which enables you of course to crash a lot of data and also paralyze what you're doing. And today the number of uh, examples of language models which are in the market using basically transformer is becoming bigger and bigger. It goes from Bert to Roberta uh, to Megatron Turing and also Noor. And also you have big players today which have jumped into that uh, kind of, of market to be able to build uh, those kind of models going from OpenAI, I think you're all familiar with that to also smaller companies like Lighton in France, which produced a model called Pagnol, uh, which is uh, uh, quite, quite, quite interesting in terms of usage. And you can use it already. They announced uh, their, their API uh, called Muse on which today you can already start playing with that. And predicting the next token, when you look, when we're gonna focus here on the decoder only architecture, and that's how we've been using, while well, you have basically a word where my name is, that you need, of course, to start having some kind of tokenization of it. And then you do what we call an embedding, and then you have some embeddings which are done. And then this is where you start pulling in what we call the transformer. And then uh, within that transformer that uh, you, you build, then you can, of course, have uh, the embedding and softmax where you can have those probabilities. And then you get back also through sampling your token and then GPT-3, and then you start again. So the pipeline is quite neat. Uh, basically, uh, in terms of how you build the whole system with uh, basically an entry point where you input uh, 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 the, the name and, uh, and uh, my name is, and then you have an embedding tokenizer, a decoder, and then at the end, a decoder and embedding and tokenizer, and then it goes to the, to the, the whole uh, GPT uh, approach that we talked about. 
Now, parallelism is very important in that. And this is why it made it so strong because you can parallelize all your, your different uh, techniques on how you, you approach this. And you have, of course, three steps. One is what we call the data parallelism, where you partition many batches over multiple workers with copies of the network, which is simple uh, to implement and to scale, but there's a downsize related to memory. You have a pipeline parallelism, where you have horizontal, as you can see, one after the other parallelization over the layers. And then, of course, you have what we call tensor, also parallelism, where you do parallelism at the same layer, but which requires uh, some algebraic operations at uh, the layer level, OK? Uh, and then, of course, uh, the power uh, of these the models is that they can also do what we call multitask stuff. And multitasking is very important because uh, they're quite, I would say, kind of robust in terms of once you've trained them to also go beyond their initial specific task and also be able to provide you answers to many other kind of questions you can ask. Okay. And so uh, with this, the power of these extra scale language models is that you don't need at the end to find, to, to do any kind of fine tuning because these larger models and the, the larger they get can deal with unseen tasks on the fly. Okay. And uh, you can read the paper, language models are few shot, few shot learners from Brown and all, which explains this in a quite uh, nice manner on how basically they can, they can deal with, uh, with, new, uh, with new kind of, 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 of situations uh, in, 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 in that they encounter. Uh, I give here, for example, uh, the kind of translation on the picture on the right that you can see that uh, you can use with what we call few shot. And uh, whenever you have a zero shot, well, here there is no example which is provided and only description of the task only. On a one shot, one example is provided. And on a few shot, you only have a couple of examples which are, which are provided in that case. Now let's go to my interest after this introduction of giving you a bit of highlights. I mean, we could spend a lot of time on that, but my goal here was mostly, mostly specifically to explain the introduction of what is these approaches that are being used and how we decided on our side to build up something we found was not existing within the Middle East region in building the largest uh, Arabic generative model. And then taking the opportunity while building this model to understand more deeply, I told you the question I raised at the beginning about what's the situation with AI and the energy and the carbon footprint, footprint it's having. Now, NOR basically, uh, we started it, as I said, around eight months ago. And the idea was to build basically the, uh, one of the biggest R models, which uh, did not exist at that time. The biggest was uh, R, RGPT with 147 billion parameters. There were also other models which were there basically called R Berg and RT5. And our goal was to build something around 10, 13 billion model, 13 billion parameters model to have the same kind of, I would say kind of performance as what you have basically in French today and other types of languages. And uh, it, it, it consists of using the similar architecture that I was mentioning before related to the GPD-3 with this transformer decoder uh, approach on which you have this pipeline. It's a trained in self-supervision fashion to predict the next token. So you don't label all the data, otherwise it's not possible. Uh, we use a lot of diversified sources of text going from news, government, uh, poetry, and also crawling. And we only use one epoch for training. As you can see here, uh, the different um, uh, quality of data that we gather uh, in different, I would say, uh, uh, um, places. And depending on, on, on where we got the data, as you can see, the quality is quite different. And the quality has also a huge impact on the kind of results that you get with NOR. We also spend, of course, time in processing the data where you need to remove what we call the directrix. And also in Arabic, for, some, for the Arabic speakers here, while well, you have uh, things related to uh, characters on the top of the letters and, and below, which makes also the situation more complicated in terms of how you will do your, your processing. And we used also CCNet to extract high quality monolingual data set from web crawl data. So this is a very important because you have at the beginning something like 500 gigabit of data, which is quite great. But when you do the quality passage and you, you start working on it, then you end up with something like roughly uh, 100 gigabit or less. And so the steps that you need to do are basically what we call deduplication, removing the duplicates 
uh, at uh, basically the paragraph text level, because this is also important when you get all the data sets. So there's a lot of work related to that. Then also the language identification, uh, identify the language of the text for every document and do also what we call some LM filtering, which is classify every text according to its perplexity score into head, high quality, middle and tail, which is basically low quality in that, in that case. And so in our case, we also spent doing what we call the tokenization of it. And uh, what we decided to do is to use a BPP, BPE at uh, the byte level. Uh, there are of course other candidates where you could do it at uh, the uh, sentence piece level or also use what we call morphological tokenizer, which are in general are uh, inefficient in inference. Uh, and then also looked at the perfect coverage rate with a good compression factor. Looked as we produce a vocabulary size also related to the tokens that we did around 50,000 and also an embedding dimension of around uh, more than 12,000. And the maximum token that uh, we were considering uh, there was roughly around 2048. And you have here the classical type of training pipeline where you have the data, you use, you, you use CCNet to process it, and then you use this uh, byte BPE tokenizer. And then basically once you have your tokens, uh, you do the embedding uh, just after around that. And then the training, which was also quite important because we needed to invest basically on an HPC infrastructure by having a supercomputer with 160 uh, uh, A, A100 GPUs uh, to be able to train this 10 billion parameters with multi-head attention layers and looking also at defining what we call the cross entropy loss and also the learning rates uh, that you have with this model in which you go. And so, when you do that, of course, you generate a, a very nice model. At the moment, we haven't released it to the public, but we'll release the 1.3 billion for the public and the 10 uh, uh, we will, we will, uh, we will, is not being released to, to the public because we have also some things to, to, to be used on. But the 1.3 will be publicly available. We're finalizing the website. But you can do what we call semantic uh, sentiment analysis with it. Uh, you can ask questions, answers in Arabic, and you get the answers. You can also basically, uh, as a model, generate a text from a title. Basically, you can do some extension of text. You start providing the beginning of a text. You have the end of the text. You want to do, typically in Arabic, what we call public release or public press release. So you start putting the by bullets, what are the main points of your public uh, press release. And then it generates you uh, the, uh, the, 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 the press public release. So these are the kind of things that people use in language models, because especially the extension of text is very nice. You can also, by giving some bullets related to, uh, to some ads that you want to have, it creates you the text of the ads. And you can also play with the temperature uh, with our coefficient that you put in there, meaning that depending on the temperature that you put, you can have a text which is very strict. Otherwise, a, strict, a text which is longer in terms of exploring more information that it can give you above what the strict information that you have inputted at the beginning. Now, let me go on the part which I told you is, is the main, uh, uh, I would say, part that I wanted to talk about is that, uh, of course, we got the model, but we wanted through the whole process to be able to assess what's exactly the pinpoint in terms of energy consumption when you start building a model of that size using 160 GPUs of training uh, uh, during a couple of, of, of weeks. And basically, you want to understand better what are the big points. Now, as you all know, uh, the major progress in AI has been done through deep learning. And this is the classical techniques uh, uh, related to that. And the demand for compute for deep learning is increasing exponentially. And we're seeing, of course, more and more people crashing that data. And, and there's not a full still understanding of how much basically it's incurring in terms of uh, carbon footprint. And this brute force technique, of course, is being questioned. And our, and our goal here is to give you a bit of insight on where we think uh, are the major points on which we have to work on. So of course, energy consumption of extra scale models uh, is, depends on many factors. So the first one, which is the most obvious is the model size and the size of the data set. Uh, if you give the mo given the model size and the data, set, uh, the data size, you can determine the number of flops required to train the model. There's also, of course, a second step, which is the serving one. And we'll talk also that serving the model when the people want to inquire and get some solutions, this also consumes in the inference phase. But in case during the service, 
side ser, the, during the serving time, the model side determines the number of flop per forward pass. And so, of course, if you serve a model with a smaller number of parameters, it's much better for you in, in some sense. The second is, of course, also the hardware characteristics on which you're going to be running uh, your, your training. And the number of flops the hardware can perform and its nominal power is also important. And as you all know, uh, we've been going from what we call V100 to A100s, and now with the recent release of NVIDIA to H100. The third one also, which has a factor, is the data center and the efficiency of the data center in terms of how it, it's cooling down the whole system. And there, there's a metric called the power or user effectiveness, which allows to measure the energetic efficiency of the data center. Of course, there's also, by the way, what thing which is important is, is the energy supply mix, meaning that if a data center at the end or your whole system is powered by solar, then of course, in terms of, of what I call carbon footprint, it's not gonna be the same. So depending on where you run, also your data center being either in France, which has a, a big mixture of nuclear, for example, compared to another country, which is more carbon, then of course, this has also an impact on where you run and where basically your system is installed. Then the other aspect is also basically within the sources that you use, which has also an impact. So there's of course the storage and transfer cost. And usually data is stored on servers and the average peak power per terabit roughly, that's a figure we've been using is 11.3 uh, watts per terabyte. Then you have also transferring data between nodes, which requires also energy as well. And there you have an average of 6.38 kilowatt or hour per terabit transfer. You have also the experimentations on which you're gonna do your data curation processing, and also the whole part related when we talk about it on research and development for data validation, tokenization, and hyperparameters fine tuning. There's also of course the part related in your sources on uh, training the, uh, of the final versions of the model. There is also, we'll talk about it, the part which is related to inference, where you want to serve the model and how often you serve it is also important and how many tokens are generated by the model. And then when you work on any paper, on any research uh, program, well, there's also all the other expenses in terms of energy, which are the personal laptops, the kind of international collaboration which are incurred if you have various teams doing it, the emails and video chat if you decide to do also conference calls to be able to build that model, and also the travels and the commutes which are needed to meet the people. So what I mean by that is that we try to take all the elements into account to give you the number of what is the cost of training basically such a model. So on the storage side, we use the services of Amazon S3 to store our data. And there, as I told you, uh, roughly the power per terabyte is roughly around 11.3. Uh, and of course, it depends on basically the power user's effectiveness, where we had basically a factor of 1.6. We assume here that the data is stored for six months, which was the duration of our project. And then uh, we also looked at basically the consumption in terms of impact with CO2 emissions, where the server was, and it was located in Bahrain. And there, as you can see, we counted the kind of consumption that we had related to the creation, the modeling, and the bulk. And you have there what we call the CO2 emissions and also uh, the number of kilowatts, uh, watt hours that uh, we, we consume. For the storage, roughly, we come up with a number of 1.7 megawatt hour of energy consumed just in the storage part, which makes roughly two tons of CO2 of emission. Then, as I told you, there's also the transfer that we talked about. And there, there's also uh, uh, a number of, of watts which are consumed per uh, terabyte, which is transferred roughly 638 uh, kilowatt per hour uh, per terabyte uh, transfer. And here also for the different steps where you have the, the common crawl, the processing, the created data and the modeling, as you can see, and what we process in terms of terabyte, uh, in terms of number, and also what kind of uh, transfer we did going from downloading on the pre-processing server, moving once to an archival machine and another time to the HPC used for training, downloading once, move to the archival machines and then move to the HPC, and also how you move it every time. The overall energy consumption that we came up with for the transfer was roughly 1.8 megawatt hour of energy consuming transfer, which has also roughly the same kind of number that we talked about, which is two tons of CO2 emissions in that case also. 
you have also the data processing here, okay? And for data processing, what we use is CCNet. And CCNet is a pipeline which does basically the duplication, the language identification and language filtering. And we used for that a CPU cluster with 768 cores split into 60 nodes. Uh, the cluster that we used was based in the Netherlands, okay, where we also looked at the consumption, which is roughly the number I'm giving you here. And we also estimated basically uh, the average power consumption of each node to be about 350 watts, which gives a power cluster of 5.6 kilowatts. Without going on, on the number of dumpings of CCs, the number of wall clock hours, uh, roughly the consumption of the data processing ended up roughly around one tons of CO2 uh, uh, in terms of how, how much uh, basically impact we had. Then there is the research and development before the training, where of course you need to test, you need to walk around your model, check everything. And here we had two tokenizer candidates and we decided to train two small models with 350 uh, million parameters before going to the billion. Uh, we spent time, of course, treating the hyperparameters, trying to establish the scaling laws that I talked about in terms of uh, what in which range you're going to play. And we used basically the Melixina supercomputer for R&D experiments, which was located in, in Luxembourg and uh, provided by LuxProvide. And each node of Melixina is made of 4A100 SXM 40 gigabit with a TDP of 400 watts and two AMD EPYC 77, 63 CPUs with also a TDP of 280 watts. So without going into detail of the time we spent, we come up also with something around 0 0.65 tons of CO2. So the pre-preparation in terms of understanding and things like that has also an, an impact on the overall consumption that you have in your system. And then you have the training time. And the training of course uh, uh, is also very important in terms of, 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 uh, of your impact footprint. And I put here the figure below. But in any case, uh, what we use is, uh, what is the training computer requirement in terms of flops? And we use the formula, which is roughly around six times N times D, where N is the number of tokens and D is the number of parameters. And with that, of course, you can approximate the training budget, energy consumption, and ECO2. And uh, roughly in terms of one GPU, you have to know what you observe in terms of throughput, you're roughly around 100 uh, teraflops. Uh, we use this uh, uh, node, uh, NOR HPC that I talked about with 20 nodes, which contains uh, uh, eight A100 each with 20 gigabytes of memory and also uh, CPUs, also power. And you have there the different numbers in terms of, of models that we looked at, going from the 1.3 to the 13 billion. And as you can see around the 13 billion, we're talking about uh, a... Uh, a footprint of 13.8, 13.8 compared to the various numbers that I gave before, which was roughly around two. Now there's also the inference. And something that we forget is inference, in fact, is the most costly part in terms of what you're gonna be doing. An A100 GPU is enough to hold a NOR model of 13 billion parameters. If you go with the assumptions where the inference time per generated token is constant around 50 milliseconds, which never, which, uh, whichever the number of processing tokens you have. And if you assume that you have a, a batch size of roughly one, an AI A100 GPU can generate up to 72,000 tokens per hour, per hour. So that basically roughly provides you 26 joules of uh, uh, consumption per generated token. So if you have three billions of tokens, and that's what the kind of number you, you come up with, three billions of tokens would have to be generated for inference costs to catch up with training costs. And so if you go for basically uh, uh, a world average emission per kilowatt, kilowatt watt, or watt hour of 475, you get that 300,000 tokens uh, generated per kilogram of CO2 emissions. So I think this is quite important because what it shows you is that uh, if we take OpenAI, because at the moment we haven't still generated a lot of usage of NOR, which generates around 4.5 billion words per day with GPT-3, and assuming that NOR will be having that kind of, of request, you're talking about 30 tons of CO2 emissions per day just for serving. And so this is also something that usually people forget is that the serving basically part uh, or inference part is having a huge impact on what you're doing. 
And then there's the additional costs. Uh, we wanted to take them account because it was a collaborative project, I told you, with scientists uh, who were in Paris. We had also our team here. And we took also into account all the international flights with three round trip flights, which were done uh, within the project. And that was around 6.4 6 6 uh, 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 of, of emissions. And also basically all the time we spent in video conferences, discussions, things like that, which we also took into account in the overall cost of our model. And at the end, what happens is that we come up excluding the inference time, which I think uh, I told you is very important with basically total energy consumption and CO2 footprint of roughly something uh, which is uh, 59, basically megawatt hour of energy consumption to build such a model. And basically that gives you in terms of CO2 emissions, 36.5 tons of CO2 emissions that you're doing. So when you look at it, it's a big number, but it's not so big uh, in the sense that uh, the training consumes, but it's not the thing which overtakes everything. As I told you, when you look at uh, the part related uh, to the inference per day, which is roughly 30, you have here a total number, which is 36, which you use once and for all, and the other, you're spending it nearly every day. So inference can overtake easily the training cost in one of few days of intensive serving. And the breakdown of CO2 footprint, of course, is highly dependent on the localization of the workloads and the local carbon intensity of this electricity mix that I'm talking about. Of course, there are other exogenous uh, external factors that you can take into account. We took it, just like the collaboration that we're talking about, but they're not uh, substantially the most important part. The training, as you can see, is the biggest part in terms of the carbon footprint. And then, of course, once you start serving it and using it, it has uh, an impact. I want to finish with a couple of slides about, of course, the best practices. If you want to build now, some kind of new models. And if you have a lot of GPUs available around you and you wanna go through these kind of architectures that I was mentioning. The first one that you can work on is on more efficient architectures, okay? And one, you, one thing you can do is the mixture of what we call expert. You split the fully connected layers of a transformer into distinct experts. They can bring significant here in energy saving since experts are only sparsely, sparsely activated. Then of course, you can also consider the sparsity of the network. And then you can also, as I told you, with this uh, recent uh, paper that was just brought in, play also with this optimal trade-off in reducing basically the size of your model, training it longer, playing with the data size, so that uh, the inference time and the inference cost will cost you less. Then you can do also work on inefficient inference with quantization, where you reduce the numerical precision, or distillation, where basically you try sampling or train smaller models a uh, so smaller model from the large one. And then of course, looking at also an efficient implementation that you can do with the best throughput. And the last, of course, but I think this will take more time, is uh, looking at other types of machine learning techniques that you can employ. But as you know, uh, there hasn't been made, made, been made any kind of major discovery these last years with, uh, with, with this approach. On the hardware, there are also things on which you can work. The data center choice is very important where you're gonna run it. And if it's, uh, as I told you, powered with some kind of uh, green type of energy, uh, the local carbon, carbon intensity, okay, that you're playing with, with, and of course the efficient inference where you can uh, basically select a tailored accelerator for inference according to the model characteristics. And then, then of course, there's also uh, best practices where I think we should also work on as a community is basically first uh, uh, looking at how we can, in our collaboration, reduce the costs of all these travels when we start. And this is what I'm doing today, by the way, by giving a remote uh, 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 keynote here uh, from Abu Dhabi to, to you guys, where you reduce, of course, the kind of, 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 uh, of, of travels. But I think also uh, a best practice is also the fact that I think in, in the overall realm of the AI community, when we start publishing papers, I think everybody should take an effort in terms of when he finishes his paper to put also in the paper, the cost of incurred in terms of energy consumption. I think already the cost in terms of money is important to tell the people, well, this paper cost me $100,000 to publish. And we're seeing that kind of a figure, by the way, coming in for the papers accepted at ICML and others, but also basically the kind of, of footprint, which would be a good practice in understanding whenever a paper is published, 
what is the total amount of, of, of carbon footprint it impacted to get that paper done. And I think this will also push a lot of more people to be very more cautious about how they publish, uh, publish their papers in terms of, of the numbers they can get. Now, going to the end-to-end -end assessment, I told you, if we're looking only at the development cost, and I told you that the development cost, in fact, turns out quite surprisingly, not to be so big. It's really about all the inference that we're gonna be taking after in terms of usage of that model. If you take an average American, he emits roughly 20 tons of CO2 a year, and a jet plane doing a round trip between San Francisco and New York uh, has roughly 180 tons of CO2 emissions. We're talking here about 35, 36.5 tons of emissions. And basically uh, the main driver of CO2 footprint, of course, is also what kind of, 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 of usage of power that you use to power your ha hardware. And as I told you, you need also to be very cautious about once you produce it, how you do an, an efficient uh, inference practice of the usage. And one thing to do, as I told you, is with this recent, I would say kind of approach that has been pushed around playing with the size of the model and the training time, you could be able to train smaller but smaller models for which then the inference would be uh, consuming a bit less and you will be playing it with that equation that I was talking about. I think I'll finish right now. I, I took, I think more time. My talk was around, should have been 30 or 35 minutes, but I think I, think I took 40 minutes. So I'm, I'm quite sorry, but I'm open for a couple of questions if you have. Thank you very much, uh, Merwan. Uh, well, there's no uh, question yet in the chat, in the Q&A tool. Uh, well, I have uh, a few questions. Thank you for this very exciting talk. Um, first, you said that the, in the state of the art you, of building a language, language model, uh, there was not uh, an existing uh, study like like this in uh, regarding the Arabic language. But did you uh, did you find this uh, regarding another language or re regarding a similar project? Yeah. So there was one paper uh, doing it for for English, uh, not taking the whole system as we tried to do because we started at the beginning, but trying to look at it. Yes. There is a paper. Yeah, which looks at this. Yes. So of course this is getting momentum in terms of understanding uh, how, how much you consume. Yeah, and this kind of, uh, of method could, could be uh, extended to, to any uh, AI project or AI uh, uh, study, uh, like you said, uh, so, so that uh, at the end you can, uh, you can assess, okay, this project costed uh, so Yeah, I, I think so. If, if people start writing the paper, especially in AI, because the computing part is very important, so I think if people start, you know, considering how much time they spend on some parts, they could come up with a, a, a best practice for conferences where each paper submitted also provides the carbon footprint of that paper, which was generated. Yeah, but that could go, of course, also for other people who do just MATLAB simulation. But I think that number is, is so low. But in our case, I think it makes sense because the people who are training now, these models are so big that you have a substantial number, which would make sense. Mm, actually, yeah, there are big numbers. But I think uh, in the community, that could be good. It could be something uh, that IEEE could push, ACM could push, and we could, could create some kind of conference which does that. And that would be good practice because then people will, will realize how important to be more, I mean, efficient in how they, they produce those papers. Yeah, that's or a good those, idea. Those projects or those models. That's a great idea. And uh, even, even then, uh, do you think that uh, there are methods as well to estimate uh the consumption uh prior to the um, to the project so that you could for, for instance when you respond to a call for project uh provide this uh this estimation uh along with the data management plan ethics and so on i think now with the experience we're having it's important because of course in the project that we did there was some unforeseen steps that we didn't realize and then we had to do but I think you can get a global figure because now you get more practice about how people do and then you can do it. But I think uh, now the more people will be doing it, the more you get a good practice in terms of already getting some average numbers benchmark from the others that you could use to assess your thing and take the decision. But what you're saying is also good, meaning maybe for the project acceptance at the EU level, stuff like this, when you do submission, 
you have to say, you know, my project will impact the planet with this yeah. amount of CO2. And, and this, is, this, this is the number I give. Yeah, that could be a good way also to get those best practices in, 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 in the field. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, but thanks for the idea anyway. <laughs> okay, uh, if there's no question in the, in the chat, I think we will close the session because we are already five minutes late. Uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Merwan, for this uh, uh, talk. And uh, Thank you, and hope to see you next time. Next time, yeah. Bye-bye.